Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about loading and saving games. I've gotten a lot of questions about this, so I'm going to answer it, but I want you to know this is a very high level answer. I think some people are literally asking me how to load and save their game, which I cannot answer because one, it's highly dependent on what language you're writing in, what engine you're using, even if it's your own, and what decisions you've made about how you want load and save to work. So instead, I'm going to describe a lot of the high level stuff, including the decisions you have to make before you even write a line of code. If you want to know the low level stuff, look up serialization for whatever your language and engine is. There should be a lot of tutorials on how to do serialization. That's what you want. So let's talk first about what kinds of save game systems there are and kind of the pros and cons for those. So the first one and the one I've, I've liked using a lot is you can save anywhere, anytime. These are the hardest ones to write because you have to save the state of many, many things. And sometimes things that's hard for you to get the state for. For example, if you can save anywhere in an RPG, can you save when a character is in the middle of an animation? Maybe he's being knocked back and you hit save. Maybe they're falling and you hit save. Maybe they're in the middle of casting a spell, which has an animation and they're surrounded by particle effects and there's AI that is reacting to it. Save. So these are the hardest ones to write because literally every system in your game will be required to be able to load and save its state. And many of those will be systems maybe you didn't write. Maybe you brought down a third party physics engine, but you wanna load and save everywhere. So you need to know how to interrogate that physics engine and say, where is this character located? What state are they in? What, you know, what's, and what are every detail about that state I would need so I can recreate it in your engine. By the way, some of them don't provide that. So you won't be saving during a fall because the physics engine doesn't give you either all the ability to read the state or more common, doesn't give you all the ability to set the state. So sometimes depending on choices that have been made that have nothing to do with load and save, you are now restricted to what kind of load and save you're going to do. So probably a more common load and save system will be you can save in some places and at some times, but not everywhere, anytime. <clears throat> Examples of restrictions like that I've seen are you can save whenever the game isn't in combat. That's a common one. That avoids a lot of state variables that only have to do with combat, especially in AI, um, where you have NPCs deciding what they're doing moment to moment as opposed to their very high level AI, which is I was walking here or I was gonna stop and look around. I've also seen games where you can only save when you're back in town. So that not only presupposes you're not in combat, but also you can only save in certain locations in the world that probably don't have a lot of state change, uh, especially if you're not allowed to fight in town or the NPCs are marked as essential there. Saving back in town really restricts a lot more of what the save game has to understand how to save the state for. And then there are other ones that say you can only save when you go to rest. So when your character rests or camps or sleeps or whatever your game calls it, you're also given the option, do you want to save at this point? This is a really restrictive way of doing it, but if you think about it, it guarantees you won't be in the middle of a dialogue, you won't be casting a spell, nobody's in the middle of falling, so you can literally ignore and not have to interrogate or reset your physics engine, your animation system, your particle effect system. There's just a bunch of systems that won't ever need to know about load and save. Some other systems I've seen, and these are real common in consoles, you have checkpoints where the game automatically saves when you reach a certain spot. It can be a physical location. It could be the an end of a story act or something like that. Checkpoints make it really easy because you're defining exactly when and where a save can even happen. 
<clears throat> and there is even more modules then that will never need to know anything about save because it's known that you can only save at this particular spot. So not all story variables, basically just it's the end of the act. What story variables will carry over to next acts or into end slides? All the rest you can throw away. Now, a subset of checkpoints are auto saves. So you may have a game that lets you save anywhere or save in a lot of places, but it also has an auto save system, especially like you're going to talk to a boss or maybe when you transition maps, it auto saves. Auto saves are kind of like checkpoints in the sense of usually less can be saved, but they're more of a way of making sure that the player doesn't end up in a bad state if the map transition messes up or they die when they encounter the boss. And then related to autosaves are quick saves. Quick saves are when the player says, I want to make a save and hits a button and it's legal to do so because you can even have quick save systems and systems where you can't save everywhere. And then the quick save would just go, can't save here. But if you can, quick saves are just go ahead and make a save. I don't want to go through a UI. I don't want to ask, answer any questions. Just make a save. This is important for the next stage of what you have to think about for load and saves, which are UI choices. Several of the UI choices you have to make for save games are how many slots can you have? Is it an infinite number of slots? And by infinite, I mean until you run out of hard disk space or cloud save space or wherever your save games are being stored. Or is it a predefined limited number of save slots? This can be different for the different kinds of saves. Maybe you're, when you the player chooses to save and goes through the UI, they can have as many as their memory will allow. <clears throat> but maybe auto saves and quick saves are limited to maybe a rolling list of three. So every time you hit quick save, it saves one and then saves two and then saves three. If you quick save again, it would write over quick save one. A lot of games do that. They kind of have to because they're not going to bring up a UI to ask you any questions, so the quick save has to have some way of knowing where to save. There are other things such as, do you get to name the save game? Do you get to type something in like, just entered the Dungeon of Doom, or first time at Rivertown? Those are great. A lot of games, though, do auto-generated save game names with things like, here's your the map location and the sub-location you are in and maybe a date stamp. Well, for auto saves and quick saves that don't bring up a UI, you kind of have to have those. So a lot of people just decide, let's just do them for all of them to make them consistent. And then finally, you have to decide whether or not your save game is going to have an image associated with it. We didn't used to do that because that was very expensive. Usually the image was bigger than the save game size. In the modern era, taking a screenshot, slapping it up as part of the save game, is easy and it also makes it easy for you to figure out what save game is which. Even if you have multiple save games in the same dungeon on the same level and you weren't very careful with the name or the auto-generated names are just a timestamp, you can look at that image and go, oh, I remember what I was doing. So those are UI decisions you have to make. Now let's talk about the save code, load and save code itself. Again, I'm not gonna show you how to serialize. You need to look that up for your specific engine and language. But I will tell you like, first I'll tell you what I do and then decisions you're gonna have to make yourself. So in general, what I tend to do for load save is for every module, if I was doing it in C or every class, if I was doing it in C++ or C Sharp, I would write a load method and a save method that understands how to load and save that module or class's particular data. I'm just gonna say class from now on. It's collection of thing, of relevant things. So what tends to happen with this method is it's past a file pointer. And if you're saving, then you write out your data at that with that file pointer and return. If you're loading, then you load in your data from that file pointer and you return. Now, some decisions you have to make if you're going to do this is, well, there's several. First of all, is that file pointer at the right spot? In other words, has the parent passed into you, the file pointer aimed at your section of data? 
If yes, then you can do this. And it's usually a really fast way of doing it because you can just grab that file pointer, load your data, return. But it requires you to follow a very specific rule of it better be at the right spot. And when you're done, you better have left it at the correct spot past you. If you don't do that, that because nobody besides you knows what the data should be, bugs will propagate. So if you read in the data, but don't leave it at the very next section after yours, the next load will fail because the file pointer is not pointing correctly. These are really hard to debug because a bug will show up in a save game not loading and it will show up in load methods that aren't the one that has the problem. It, in fact, if you're lucky and it shows up in the very first load method that follows the one that messed up, you can easily go, oh, this load method isn't pointing at the right section. It must be the previous guy's fault. But they're, trust me, they're hard to find. If you say no, if you decide no, I will have each method reposition the pointer. That solves that problem of propagating errors because it makes it very self-contained. It also makes it easy to add new sections. If you add a new module, a new class, and it needs to write out its data, it can just put it in there and then it finds its correct section when it's past the file pointer. However, this method is always slower than assuming the file pointer is in the right place because you are literally calling out to your save device, whether it's hard drive or cloud, and having it move that file pointer having it search through your data for something, whether you know how many bytes in it is, you have, there's an index somewhere, you have to look up in the index, you're going to do extra work and it will slow down your load and save process. Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe your load save process is so nearly fast that you don't have to worry about it. But I've worked on games where it's really slowed it down a lot. The next decision you have to make is do you save out the data as raw data? Meaning if you have an int, do you just write out, you know, the four bytes that are in your int with an F write, and then you F read in that int, you know, from your load tape, if you were doing it in C. This saving it with raw data, makes it super fast and gives you the smallest possible save file you're going to get, but you will need to learn how to serialize everything by hand. You won't have to know how to serialize not only your base data, ints, floats, doubles, but you're going to have to figure out how to handle pointers because if you have an array of pointers to items, you're going to have to save those items and then reconstruct that array of pointers during the load. So you're going to be doing memory allocation. You're going to be then setting pointers to the memory that you've allocated. You're going to have to do all this by hand. It's a lot of work, but it'll give you the fastest, smallest save files you ever have. Now, let's say you don't want to do that. Because like JSON got really popular, basically string-based object saving. In fact, JSON is human readable. Um, the nice thing about this, doing it that way, is it is very easy to write code for it. Like if the sections have a string at the beginning saying, here's combat code, and your combat module goes, find that string that's like bracket combat code. You find it, you know you're in the right section, and then you can read in your variables like, Hey, here comes an array of 10 objects. Um, here's the name of each object, you know, string. Here's the, the data on each object stored as a string. You know, here's the, you know, health value of them stored as strings. It makes it very easy to read, very easy to write, but your save game will be very big and very slow. Again, if that size and speed isn't a concern to you, rock on. If it is, mm. Now, it also has a impact what decisions you just made on versioning. Versioning is when you have a save game either from a previous version of the game, like you put out a patch for your game, so now you have a 1.1. Can that 1.1 read 1.0 saves? Also, if you had a save that was made with a DLC, let's say you played your whole game, you bought a DLC, you kept playing, and you made a save with that DLC, can the... Base game, if you reinstall the base game without the DLC, can you load that save game? Um, if a mod, if you support modding, if you 
play a modded game, can the base game load it? If you play a modded game, can does it know what mod it is? So if it goes to load a modded game and that mod isn't on your game anymore, will it know that? <clears throat> Some games just fail. Some games detect that and say, I can't read this. Sorry. Some games detect that and go, I don't know how to read data for this mod or for this DLC. So I'm going to load the base game version of this save game. There's a whole bunch of decisions you have to make. And that's basically how you do versioning. I will tell you, if you went with the human readable JSON string based, it's a lot easier to do versioning because if you get to a section you don't recognize, you can have a default. Like, I don't know what this is, what section this is. My default is to not have an item like this. So if you recognize, if there's an item you don't recognize because it's only in the DLC, you simply don't have it anymore. It's not in your inventory. Harder to do that with the raw data. You can still do it. Also, it's something you need to keep in uh, in mind for how you're going to handle when you patch your game. If a 1.1 generates a save game that 1.0 can't read, you need to decide, is that something you can see in the UI when you look at it, that this is a save game for 1.1 and you're playing a 1.0 version? How does it display that? Is it Will it try to load it and fail or will it actually display in the UI this is an unloadable save game? To load it, you need to go to a newer version. Will it tell you what to do? Or will it just mark it and like, will it gray it out and say, I, I don't know how to load this? These are all decisions you have to make as part of your load save game data if you want to support versioning. I told you this is really complicated and I haven't even mentioned a line of code. I think that is most of what you need to think about. So to sum it up, um, think of how, what kind of save game system you want to support. Think about the UI choices you want to make for that save game system. And then when you're actually writing the code, think about how you want that code to work with data. Is it going to be raw data? Is it going to be serialized into a string or some other human readable format? Those are things you need to think about for load saves. Good luck. It is a complicated thing to do. And I'm sure people are going to weigh in with far better ideas than I had here. But this is, in general, the way I did it and the scope of what I did. So I hope that answers people's load save questions.